have you ever wondered, I'm doing all the things right to keep my philodendron happy, my Moncera happy, my Anthurium happy, whatever plant you might have based on the generic kind of advice out there, but you're still not getting it quite right. Stick around with me and I will talk about how the morphology or the appearance and how a plant grows makes a difference in how you care for that plant. Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, Has Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today I want to dive into a topic about kind of the morphology or the look and appearance or the way that a plant grows specifically and what that might mean in terms of the care that you give it. Now this has got many different facets and I'll try to kind of break them down into nice kind of easily understandable sections basically. But it is kind of, in essence, what you're trying to do is not work against your plant, but work with your plant in terms of what it's used to growing. So without further ado, let's have a look. So the first thing I'm gonna say, I know it's boring, and I know everybody's gonna have an issue with this, research. I will say this until I'm blue in the face, and even if you are like most of us that don't necessarily do enough research before you get a plant that you're unaware of, basically, in your collection, do it straight after you've got the plant in your care because you'll be able to adjust the care quite quickly. And what do I mean by research? I mean look into its natural habitat. Where is it growing naturally? If it's a succulent, where does it grow? not just the location, look at things like the altitude. How far above sea level is it? Does it have um, a lot of rain when it's getting there, where it lives basically? Does it have an awful lot of humidity? Does it live in a cloud forest? All of these things are gonna be super, super, super important because you can still get cacti, maybe not so necessarily cacti, but succulents, that you think I need to give it the brightest light because obviously this plant is coming from like a desert condition. But if it's a succulent that is used to growing under other things, even in a kind of deserty conditions, too much bright light, I'm thinking more of the grow lights because even in the house, usually even the brightest light in the house might not be bright enough compared to what they're getting, is one of those things that they might not necessarily like because they need slightly lower light levels. The other thing is looking at kind of your soil substrate. All of these things, they're gonna be really important. So doing your research beforehand will be game changing. Now let's talk a bit more about things like appearance on the leaves and what that might mean for you. And I've got here the El Choco Red Philodendron. This doesn't apply, and I know I've heard all of you, this doesn't apply just to the aroids, the standard philodendrons, anthuriums, monstera, all of these things. This applies to any plant that you're bringing into your care. It's just being able to quickly judge on what you're seeing because the plant itself is communicating with you as to what it might want. That first point that I was making before, the research is also gonna come in super, super handy. But let's take, for example, this monstera, monstera, philodendron, El Choco Red, basically, or the Rubri Juvenile. So the one thing that most people are aware of this plant and one of the reasons why a lot of people will get it is the red backs. Now, 20 questions, or one question specifically. What do we all know after years of being kind of engrossed in kind of information about houseplants, about houseplants that have got red backs? A lot of the time they are used to growing in some of the lowest light conditions within their environment. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail as to why some of these plants might have the red backs. The other thing that some people might be aware of, especially with some of these plants, like the Rube Rejuvenile, is the more mature it gets, a lot of the times you might lose some of those red backs because again, remember how this plant might grow. It's growing on the jungle floor and then it will hit potentially a tree climb up and as it gets higher, it gets closer to the light. Guess what it no longer needs because it's not getting dappled, dappled, low, low lights at the baseline of the jungle. It doesn't need the red backs anymore. So a lot of the times, unfortunately, because some people 
specifically will buy plants like this for the red backs, the backs would go green basically because it no longer serves its purpose. So things like looking at the morphology of the leaves themselves will give you a lot of information. And actually whilst I've got this here as well, something like the texture of the leaves, like is it a velvety leaf? Does it have hair or trichomes or pubescence? These things will give you ideas as to where it's growing and what its best conditions are going to be. So let me give you an example of how this becomes practical. Red leaves, don't give this too much light. Mm -hmm. It's simple. But, and I know this is a plant that more people are aware of now, but say, and this is the whole point of this video, it's not necessarily for the plants that everybody knows and they've been growing for a while and they, there's enough videos or content out there of people telling you this is how it's grown and you can see a consensus of yes, everybody's doing this, so it's probably right. I am talking, because this question has come back to me a lot of the times when people ask me, they're just like, you end up buying a lot of plants that a lot of people don't have. How do you know what care to give it? Because a lot of the times the information out there, especially for the lesser known plants, is a slim at best, basically. Usually it's non-existent. I rely a lot on what I've learned over the years on morphology of plants and growing as many plants as I have. I can usually make some relatively educated guesses as to what that plant might need. Usually I will then back that up by going, I've got this assumption because I've got the red leaves on the back of this plant. If I do some research, is that true? And then I find out, yes, great, fantastic. So lower light levels. Same thing goes if it's got a pubescence or if it's got like the velvety leaves, it might be because it's trying to either repel water because it's in a really, really humid condition. And if it's got very, very humid conditions, like a lot of people might know with the Queen Anthurium, because it's got the velvety leaves, a lot of people know they're just like, oh, I need to have it in an Ikea cabinet or a terrarium or something like that because it needs high levels of humidity. Even if we didn't know everything we knew about this plant as we do because so many people like it, have purchased it, all of these things. If you know that information that you know what, it's got pubescence, which might mean X in terms of humidity, then do that. The thing that you need to balance out is a lot of the times something like velvety leaves is because they're in a high humidity environment and they need to make sure that they don't get too much moisture on there. So you might sit there logically thinking, actually, if I give it slightly less humidity, it will be fine. But no, this is how the plant has grown. It's lovely that you want to treat it better than what it would get in its normal environment, but it is built for that environment, basically. Let's talk substrate now. And usually with this, you can get ideas by looking at the roots. So I'll bring this in a bit closer and you hopefully might be able to see the roots there. This is my Luxurians X Regal, no, Magnificum. <laughs> this is the hybrid that I recently purchased and looky, it has got a new baby leaf coming in, which is great. This is already faster than just the straight Luxurians basically, but the point I'm trying to make is look at its roots. And there's a reason why I'm holding an Anthurium for this because there's a lot of kind of chatter online about the fact that Anthuriums generally will do really well in semi-hydro. I am part of that chatter, I have said this. And I just want to amend my comment now. I'll let everybody else amend their own comments basically. Look at the roots and again, that shows you morphologically what this plant might be used to. So this specific Anthurium has got relatively kind of medium sized chunky roots that are quite fuzzy. This to me might mean that it could do well in both types of substrates, both the semi-hydro substrate, especially when it's got big, big air pockets and kind of ways for moving kind of that air within its media. And also something like an airier soil mix because it will do fine in both. However, and I can't pick it up unfortunately because it is right behind me, my Vitarifolium, where some of the roots are the size of some of my fingers and they look a bit like Phalaenopsis roots. They are very, very chunky. They get kind of very dry looking. I'm talking about the aerial roots now. That plant I will almost exclusively grow in something like semi-hydro because I know that it doesn't want that much moisture around its leaves. Now, certain other plants that you might get, even an Anthurium that most of the times people with Anthuriums are like, oh, they've got relatively thick roots. Yes, 
but there is thick, there is thicker, and there is thin anterior roots. And that's the thing that I need you to kind of remember here, because if you see, and this is easier if you've grown a few anthuriums and you've seen a couple of different anthurium roots, because this has got medium-sized roots, and for instance, something like my Microspadix, and I'll see if I can pick it up. It's unfortunately in soil now, so you can't see the roots. So apologies for it looking as busted as it has done. However, I will say it was slowing down in growth and not doing very much. And since I've put it in soil outside of semi-hydro, it has done exceptionally, exceptionally well. And I don't think you can even see any roots. And mm, you might be able to, if I bring it in really, 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 really close, you might be able to just about spot some very, very thin roots within that soil media. This anthurium has got very thin roots for an anthurium. It's not quite as thin as something like a begonia, which is almost like hair-like structures, but this has got relatively thin roots. What does this mean? It needs more moisture, basically. It still needs that aeration, but it needs more, something that retains the moisture a bit more than something that's got big roots, basically. So this definitely, and I've learned my lessons, my anthuriums with the finer roots now have all gone into soil and they are doing so much better than they ever would have done in semi-hydro. Now I know a lot of the desirable anthuriums tend to have the thicker roots, a bit like this hybrid here. And yes, with those you might be lucky to use either or, but the thing that you need to remember about soil media is where are these plants growing? And yes, aroids and everything that we call an epiphyte that's growing on something, because epiphytic is growing epi something. Um, so again, the, the Greek side is like the epi is upon. Um, epiphytic, phyto, is plant, basically. So it's growing upon a plant, basically. I think that's the translation that it would work in my head from the Greek side of things. So yes, but you can be epiphytic without necessarily, I know it's kind of counterintuitive, without being attached to say the, the bark of a tree somewhere. Some of these plants might be epiphytic, but also lithophytic. And lithophytic, lithos, means rock or stone. So lithophytic means something that grows on rocks or stones. <laughs> I guess what the semi-hydro mix is a lot of the time, little baby rocks and stones. <laughs> so have a look and again this is where your research will come in really useful because if you can find something that said yes it's epiphytic but it's also lithophytic then it means you know what it will do well in either soil or the the side of things that might be the semi-hydro but again that gives you a bit of an understanding if it can do both and if you put it in soil it really needs to be quite airy soil but if something has got lithophytic in there, it, it, this is what I'm saying, it's giving you the indication that it needs more air because something that's just growing on a rock gets an awful lot of air around its roots. The other big, big thing to be aware of is things that are like obligate climbers. And let me see if I can pick one up. Uh, annoyingly, it has attached. So <laughs> obligate climbers, or even if you think of something more extreme like a shingling plant, so think the Monstera dubia, or dubia, I don't know. These plants need something to attach to because that is the only way they're gonna grow. And you can see this, because a lot of times if you get really flat leaves that are flat, and again, look at how it's being sold, because the Monstera dubia now, when it's being sold, is sold against a plank, and it's very, very flat. <laughs> Letting it grow on something that isn't flat might cause you issues, or at least something that won't give it support. Same thing goes for obligate climbers. If you see something that grows very, very tall, very quickly, and it's got very intense aerial roots that need to tap into things, think Monstera Deliciosa, because I know a lot of people don't necessarily attach it to anything, but it will do a lot better if you attach it to something. Obligate climbers, they need to climb. Can you have them without climbing? Yes. Will the leaves get smaller? Yes. Will the nodes, the space between the foliage grow taller? Yes, because it's reaching for what it thinks is gonna be a tree so it can attach to. So obligate climbers are gonna be one of those big things that you're gonna to need to keep an eye out for and just go, you know what, I've got this. I don't know what plant this is. I don't know anything about this plant. I know its name, hopefully. So I can do some research on it, but 
actually, how is this growing? And if it's growing in that kind of flat manner, that gives you an indication of how you need to grow it. Apologies for the slight jarring at the moment, like my camera decided to overheat and switch off. So there's fans blowing on behind it. Ah, the joys of summer. I think the temperature in here at the moment is 30 degrees at Celsius. So, and it's not a particularly hot day yet. So this is gonna be so much fun in the summer filming. But again, let's, let's come back into something like the leaf structure. So if I show you this Alocasia sinuata, can you see those deep, deep grooves that are happening within the leaves. This again would give you an indication that this is a plant that doesn't want to stay wet for too, too long. The other thing that I'm kind of noticing is, you know what, it's got very leathery leaves. It doesn't want to get moisture sitting on its leaves. So an example of how you can use this in your care, and generally you shouldn't just be spraying plants with a spray bottle to raise the humidity. People have explained enough times why that doesn't work but you really don't want to be doing it with plants like this because this is a plant that its leaves and its structure itself is telling you, I do not want that. So keep doing it to me and we're gonna have issues basically. So things like that are very, very indicative of what the plant needs and desires or what it doesn't like as well. That's the other big thing that you need to see there is does it like this or does it not like this? If I'm forcing something onto a plant that doesn't like it, that's where we're probably gonna have some issues basically. So being aware of any kind of leaf texture, especially if the leaves are leathery, that gives you an indication about the humidity level, which means to me, it would suggest to me that, and correct me if you know that this is different, this plant, not that I know too much about its humidity and I haven't attempted it out in regular household humidity, I've only ever grown it in the conservatory, but I would imagine this will do okay in regular household humidity because everything on this plant is geared and it's telling me that, you know what, I don't need, I don't need that much moisture on me, it's fine basically, I just need it off me as quickly as possible. It doesn't necessarily mean that it likes to stay dry because this is still an alocasia. And on the point of alocasias, alocasias are an interesting one as well, because a lot of people would just say, you need to keep them consistently moist and you can never, ever, 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 ever let them dry out. You can, the plant doesn't always necessarily like it, but this is a plant that if you look at it, even if you've never dealt with it before, it's got a swollen kind of growing tuber on the inside. It looks a bit like a potato. Very delicious, the colocasias rather than the alocasias I've talked about that too many times before. <laughs> um, don't, don't do what I say here, by the way, this is very specific collocations that we all eat or some nations will eat quite happily, but some of them are just not edible. So pinch of salt, pinch of salt, yeah? Not for the food, just pinch of salt for like what I'm saying, you get what I mean. <laughs> but with this, you kind of need to bear that in mind because if something's got a swollen, kind of tuber on the inside, it means that it can store some of that moisture, some of those nutrients within that structure, especially when you look at some of these leaves that are very, very kind of thick. They are filled, if you've ever cut an allocation leaf and you've kind of sliced it in the middle, you might be able to see there's loads of little cells, basically. Some of that is to help keep the plant upright because these leaves can get very heavy but it also means that water can just get moved really, really easily. And this is because a lot of the times alocasias, not all of them and colocasias, grow near river beds basically. But this doesn't always just mean it needs to constantly be sapping wet or it, some of them, yes, that it needs to be like constantly in the water. It also means that these plants are accustomed to getting droughts where the river will just pull all of this water in. And this is not getting anywhere near as much water as it would have been getting normally. So these are things that you kind of need to remember and just kind of go, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense. But all of these things combined is essentially what I was trying to talk about in the very beginning of the video. You need to have beady eyes and use what you know, what you've learned after how long of having plants to be able to judge the care that you can give to them. Instead of just going with the easy kind of way out where if you find somebody that's got the plant, it's just like, just quickly drop the message and go, what are you doing? Because it's kind of lazy. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Like try something and if it doesn't work, then reach out to somebody. The people generally are more than happy to you to like help. But 
you don't learn by not trying, basically. Does that make sense? Is that a double negative? I don't know. Um, but hopefully you get what I mean. It's, it's one of those things that if you know that certain plants, like say this anthurium, I know because of these roots, and I want to attempt doing this because I can make that connection, and it works. Or if it doesn't work, it's just like, why did it work? The, the structure seems this. That's again where your research might come in handy and just go, oh, I assumed on just by looking at it that it's like this, but actually it's slightly different. It doesn't happen that often, to be fair. A lot of the times the morphology will generally tell you the truth, but sometimes you might get some weirdness as well, like things like hybrids, things like this. When they're bringing in genetics from two different plant types, like, I don't know how to describe this, it's really interesting. Say for instance, one of the parents of this plant had had thicker roots, the other one had thinner roots. The plant, the resulting progeny has got thick roots, but it behaves as something that's got thin roots. Most of the things that you need to just bear in mind, and that's why a lot of the times things like true species might be easier to handle if you've never dealt with that plant before, because it generally will tell you what it needs by its appearance. Whilst a lot of the time hybrids generally will, but there might be a tiny bit of a lie in there somewhere. So yeah, just remember that. But I'm curious, have you ever experienced this? Have you done this kind of detective work, the sleuthing and the kind of, oh, if this, then that kind of situation with some of your house plants in terms of kind of the care that they might need based on the way that they look? If so, let me know. Have you had successes? Have you had failures? Again, let us all know down below. You know that I like to have conversations with you all in my comments, basically. <laughs> I'm that weird plant geek, basically. <laughs> but yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, bye.